and we're live. Hi everyone and welcome to session number four of the free online course in DML Commons, Program Evaluations for Connected Learning. This is a course where you'll gain practical experience in the process of educational program evaluation by exploring real-world problems brought forth by youth-serving programs who have volunteered to act as case studies in this course. Today's guests come from the Mozilla Hive Learning Network in New York City. Hive NYC is a citywide laboratory comprised of more than 70 nonprofit organizations where out of school educators, technologists, and mentors design innovative, connected educational experiences for youth. Since its founding in 2009, as part of the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative, Hive NYC has engaged more than 20,000 youth in connected learning experiences through funded programs and public events. It's a key resource for informal educators, designers, makers, artists, and technologists who lead these programs to inspire one another and share ideas for how to create better connected learning experiences for youth. And so today, I'm hoping to be joined with some additional guests, but right now I have uh, Brian Cohen from the Beam Center and Nancy Otera of Emergence Active Cognition, who is also Beam Center's Research Director from the Hive uh, NYC. Later, I hope that we will be joined by Beth Rosenberg and Christina Ulerio of Tech Kids Unlimited. And as they'll speak, I'll let them tell you a little bit more about their respective organizations and what they do. I'm also joined here by uh, Dixie Chang of the Hive Research Lab, hopefully also by her colleague soon, Rafi Santo, who's having some technical difficulties this morning. Their five-person research uh, lab also includes Professor Kylie Pepler of Indiana University and Professor Christopher Hoadley of New York University. The Research Network is an applied research partner of the Mozilla Hive New York City uh, NYC Learning Network, and it's investigating and collaborating with network stakeholders to strengthen the Hive NYC as a context for innovation in out-of-school learning organizations and as a support for interest-driven learning for young people. Before I begin to talk with them a little bit about their work, I'd like to say a little bit about the importance and evaluation of developing outcome measures that are really tailored to the particular aims of programs, instead of just purchasing or finding off-the-shelf measures uh, to measure outcomes and implementation. Also, a reminder to everyone watching too, either live or, in a, uh, or watching the recorded version, you can use hashtag uh, CLEVAL to pose questions on Twitter, and if you do them, if you're watching live, we'll try to answer them as we go, or use the chat feature where you're watching this live webcast. I hope you'll pose questions of our guests today in this way and in future sessions, so I can actually ask them, and hopefully they'll help help us with some answers to those. So to begin with, what I'd like to talk talk with you a little bit about is the importance of developing and the value of developing tailored measures of outcomes. So one thing we know with connected learning is that it has varied outcomes. Uh, tailor, uh, connected learning might uh, result in a young person discovering a new interest or finding a new career. So in order to do that, um, you know, we have to think really hard about the appropriate measures there. I'm really excited about the new forms of learning that connected learning is actually bringing about in the various sites. Um, but it also presents some challenges for evaluations. I hope as you listen today, you'll ask yourself, what, you know, what is it that I, can, I see young people saying and doing in my program that gives me a sense of the evidence that they are actually benefiting from this program? As you'll hear today, that's exactly what folks in the Hive NYC network did uh, in a way that was facilitated by the Hive Research Lab. And I think you can ask the same question of yourself as you listen and also after afterwards. And I think by doing so, what's, what will come about is a set of uh, measures or ways of at least thinking about your outcomes that are a really good fit for your particular program. So what are some of the new forms of learning that might become objects of outcome evaluations that you develop for your programs? Well, for one, one thing that connected learning is intended to do is to help young people discover new interests. So find things that they discover that they really enjoy doing and want to learn more about as they go, but maybe didn't even know that they could pursue that. 
Another thing is, is that young people may bring interests to the table and through their interactions with professionals in connected learning programs, they discover that an interest can be a career. They might say, wow, I never knew that this thing that I really love to do, whether it's writing or web design, could actually be a career, something that I could earn money doing. And so that's something that can come out of participation. Another thing is that young people can develop new ties to adults who might be able to help them in the future. These might be people in jobs, they might be people in schools or higher education institutions that can actually broker them into new opportunities. And so those are all important short-term outcomes that uh, programs can observe, but for which they're not necessarily existing measures. Uh, one of the challenges with existing measures is that they're often designed for types of programs that are quite different from connected learning. I'll give an example. One of the things that we have used in our surveys of connected learning are some traditional youth development outcomes, like a sense of the future. And those things are well designed to capture traditional youth development outcomes, but maybe not the particulars of young people designing uh, things for external audience, for example, what sorts of outcomes are related there. Uh, another measure we've used is bonding to school. But not all programs actually aim after increasing uh, students connecting connections to traditional school. They might be after other outcomes like civic engagement that are a little bit more difficult to uh, uh, impact. One of the problems with using such off-the-shelf measures if they're not well matched to your program is that the features of the program are not likely to influence the outcome scores. They're not usually to cause an increase in those. And the risk is of using such an outcome that in those circumstances is that a program can look ineffective when in fact it's very effective just with other outcomes that you don't happen to be measuring. So how do you begin if you want to do this on your own? One is you've really got to begin with the constructs. Constructs here just mean uh, a definition of the outcomes that I'm seeking to define. And more than just a name for that, you want to kind of elaborate. What does it mean to uh, be engaged civically? How do you define that in your program? Write down some definition there. Uh, focus on the big domains that are important to your programs. We focused on four in our work. One is that academically oriented outcome, something that can actually play it forward in the future of someone's schools. Another might be a set of career-related outcomes that are important. Civic engagement is an, uh, another one. And fun and enjoyment is something that we think is a really important one to consider. Then ask yourself for each of these domains, what is it that a young person would say or do in the context of your program or saying to some another adult that they care about in their lives that would give you some indication that they were um, showing growth in one of these domain areas? And third, what are the contexts that we can elicit in a formal sense, like through a survey or an interview, where we could actually elicit those kinds of things that young people would say or do that would give us some systematic way of documenting uh, that they are growing on those outcomes. And those basic steps are really the heart of developing your own outcomes. You don't need a lot of technical expertise to do this. You just need the discipline of thinking first about what the outcome is, what young people might say or do that would give you some indicator, and think hard about the situations that would elicit uh, those things that a student might say or do. That is a way of what we call in the assessment design business validity by design, meaning we're really ex we're setting ourselves up to create valid measures that are really matched to what our program is designed to be able to accomplish. That way, by doing that, we're going to find some new ways to measure the new forms of learning, of connected learning. Programs themselves, by doing this in a participatory manner, as you'll hear a little bit about today, can then own the outcomes. They can say, yeah, this is really important to us because we've come up with these ideas about what students say and can do. And then a wider variety of stakeholders can become invested in evaluation. So this is really part of that stakeholder-based evaluation approach, is to engage your participants and the stakeholders in your program in this process. So that's enough hearing from me, and now I want to uh, hear from our um, guests today. And as you speak, I'll let you introduce yourself and your organization, especially since I'm going to kind of open this up. And, and here, I'd like to hear, since I think different people have different uh, hands on the elephant of the program, uh, 
hear from different people about. Tell us a little bit about what the Hive, uh, Mozilla Hive NYC network is and also what the Hive Research Lab is. And as you speak, you'll need to unmute. Sure. Um, I will, well, I don't know, Brian uh, or anyone else, would you like to talk about the Mozilla Hive and then I can talk about Hive Research Lab? Uh, sure. Uh, Beam Center started participating with uh, Mozilla Hive about two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, and it was it was like uh, water to a, um, a man and people in the desert because we were we sort of a new organization operating in complete isolation, um, really di didn't have a very kind of uh, self-reflective. Um, uh, perspective on what we were doing and had really no idea what other people were doing. Uh, didn't know the term connected learning. Uh, so when we, it was a per, it was perfect timing for us to get involved because it put us right into the middle of a conversation that was going on uh, between practitioners uh, and with with experts uh, in the area. So it, it also connected us with our our first uh, major uh, engagements with public schools. Does that does that set set the stage enough for you, uh, Dixie or Rafi? I was going to ask Brian if yeah. you could say a little bit more about you know what what do you value about having this connection to a broader uh, network of uh, organizations that are doing similar things? Um, well, I mean, for for us again, it, it was fundamental in in the sense that you know what we do, what the Beam Center does is. Uh, Make things with students and teachers, and and understand and help them understand how making things um, can reinforce their own objectives, whether they're academic uh, or um, social, emotional, um, or just being able to you know, do better in, in their life. Um, and um, we do we did we we sort of started this practice in you know sort of a naive way. Um, we just we were focusing on the products. Um, we build projects, and we want them to work, or we want them to be beautiful. Um, we want our, um, you know, we want to have valuable uh, collaborations between artists, designers, and kids and teachers. So we really didn't we didn't have the words to describe what any of that meant um, in, uh, in in a, in a broader context. And by sitting with um, other practitioners and the, the folks from the Hive uh, and the and the, the, the guest um, sort of presenters, um, that started giving us a context. Uh, you know, we we didn't write our first grant before we were part of the Hive, and you know, writing the application to the Hive was the first time we ever had to put in writing, you know, what it was we were doing. So. Very fundamental. Right, Dixie, you want to jump in and? Uh, sure. Yeah. So I think that was a wonderful uh, kind of uh, way of describing what it's like to um, uh, be a part of the hive um, and what it's meant for some uh, organizations. Um, and so uh, I would say that um, hive, the Mozilla Hive NYC network is um, is this you know, consortium of over 70 organizations that includes museums and library networks and uh, um, it's basically a way for um, educators to come together like Brian said um, and, and kind of discuss what they're doing, share what they're doing. Um, we have these participation structures like a monthly meetup, uh, monthly calls. Um, the network is stewarded by uh, Mozilla uh, Foundation employees and, who are Trying to um, understand what sort of what sort of topics have heat. Where do folks? Um, uh, where can uh, folks be better supported? And in those ways, um, there, um, Rafi and I, when we present on the Hive, we talk about the network as having um, two general um, areas of value. One is that as a, um, a network for learning, um, which is the you know um, as members put out programs. Uh, they're helping young people learn and find, you know, their identities and their future, possible future selves. And then it's also a network that learns, and that's the um, part where, you know, folks are meeting and discussing 
um, what they've learned and other other folks in the room are learning and as Brian said you know as, as um, folks apply for these collaborative grants that are funded through the Hive Digital Media Learning Fund and um, up to now managed through the New York Community Trust um, that really helps people you know put down on paper and reflect on on what they're learning um, and gathering from others uh, I'm wondering if Nancy and Brian could say uh, one or two things concretely that they feel like they've learned from their participation in the Hive Network. Well, I think the uh, we we were fortunate enough to to receive uh, two grants from the Hive Digital Media Learning Fund, and. Um, the, there was a there was a uh, premium put on partnership um, within within the RFP for those grants, and I think that um, one concrete thing we've learned is what what a, a, a deep and meaningful partnership can be. Um, I think we at first at least I came to that idea as being sort of you know. Um, Kind of a surfacey. Um, I need something. You need something. Let's let's need it together, and, and we, you know we can make something happen. I think I think I've I've discovered, and our first grant I think worked that way. Uh, we were doing a program at um, someone else's um, site, uh, so we were bringing content um, to um, students that. Um, had access, better access to their site than to, to our site. Um, it felt like a partnership, but really, it, it really was more sort of an opportunity to do what we do in a different place. Um, our second and the, the, the grant that we're the work that we're here to talk about today was um, professional development for public school teachers, um, where those partnerships with those schools. Are, are feel much more like both they are um, they're deeper they're um, they're learning partnerships where there's there's a clear um, um, you know there's sort of an ongoing um, ability for both partners to learn uh, continuously and to be better at what they're doing together and which is which what brings us to to this call does that does that uh, answer the question? That's one concrete thing. I also learned what connected learning was. And I, th I think it's actually really interesting, Brian, that you bring up um, <clears throat> that uh, example of like first you had maybe a, a kind of like light touch partnership and it didn't feel really deep, um, and then had a maybe more robust one. Um, you know, for me as somebody who's been researching. Uh, how ideas circulate in the network and how partnerships and collaborations happen. One of the things I know is because I actually investigated specifically the organization that you partnered with on that for a long time. I did an 18-month case study um, of the organization, and it was in a process uh, of exploring ideas around maker, the maker movement and maker pedagogy, something it, it wasn't familiar with before. And while in, in your, from your frame of reference, the partnership that you did was just kind of they acted as an implementation site, they provided kids, and you guys brought in teaching artists, but I know that that was a really critical learning point in a much longer trajectory for this organization um, of various other partnerships like that, where other people came in and did things, and it validated early uh, explorations that they were doing around the maker movement and eventually led to the co-design of a maker space. So one of the things that I find really fascinating about Hive is that um, you have uh, all sorts of different types of relationships, and some of them are high touch and some of them are low touch, but they all really exist and um, one of the nice things about it is that when you have an ongoing set of relationships, an ongoing community, an ongoing conversation about ideas, there's all sorts of stuff that's happening on the level of individual members and across all these different organizations that really does uh, live up to this idea of a network that learns. And it's not always easy, but I do think that there's a lot of stuff that sometimes invisible when you're uh, operating in these kind of very distributed contexts and there's a lot of value even to maybe some smaller lower touch opportunistic uh, collaborations and they often lead to uh, longer term more intensive more learning driven kind of collaborations or they might lead to learning that maybe I don't need to partner with this person again and that's actually good too you know these ecosystems are uh, based on you know whether people can 
really live up to you know, being uh, good organizations that are able to provide uh, both good programs but also be good collaborators. So. And Rafi, you mentioned a set of case studies. And is that the sort of thing that uh, the Hive Research Lab does? And what other kinds of things does the research lab do? Sure. So um, we, <laughs> we do a lot. <laughs> um, but I mean, sometimes we, we think that we do a lot. Maybe it's just from our perspective. Uh, so we, we act as a research practice partnership, um, which I know, of course, Bill, that you um, have thought a lot about. Um, and, and I would characterize us as uh, really doing three things, uh, or four things, rather, in that partnership. The first and foremost is that we're embedded members of this community. So we act as part of the community. We're not kind of off at a distance, you know, in the ivory tower. Um, we, we really try to be uh, members of the network. And what that means is that people, you know, often just call us to, uh, you know, get advice or, you know, collaborate or to, you know, even just, uh, you know, being friends with people. It's part of being part of the tapestry. Um, so embeddedness. Uh, the second is we do uh, basic research, and, and based on that, we do formative knowledge sharing. So we're doing research on uh, uh, innovation patterns and collaboration patterns in the network and on youth trajectories and pathways within the network. And we're then circulating back through presentations and briefs and um, you know, research reports, um, uh, one-pagers, really uh, in an ongoing way, blogging, what, uh, figuring out how to share regularly, frameworks and findings and insights from our research. Um, the third is we do collaborative design. So once we hit on areas of, areas of uh, heat and focus within the network, um, we bring stakeholders together and we do uh, what we call collaborative design experiments. Um, so we'll uh, first come up with and create the context for um, new ideas um, or bring together some existing ideas around a particular issue like you know, supporting long-term pathways for young people. And then we'll help members to um, uh, prototype, and then we'll help to study uh, how these prototypes are playing out. And so I know Brian was involved in uh, an initiative called the Hive Youth Meetups that aimed to be kind of a, a cross-organizational context where youth from across the network would come together, and that was an example. Um, and really, the final thing that we work on is what we call collaborative knowledge production. So in addition to producing uh, kind of interventions or educational approaches, we're also aiming to synthesize expertise and knowledge uh, that's coming from the research that we're doing, but also existing research, and most importantly, from the network members themselves. We view the, 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 all the people in the network as experts in uh, you know, design research and in design of educational experiences, and we uh, aim to uh, bring together ideas that help to orient the community towards the North Star uh, in the form of, you know, whether it's white papers or other kinds of position papers. That's a little overview of what we do. That's great. And uh, briefly, if you can, I know you're both doing your dissertation in this work, in this space, is that right? And could you tell tell our audience, like, sort of what you're studying as part of your dissertation work, uh, Dixie and Rafi? Dixie, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, Thank you for this platform, Bill. <laughs> so um, I uh, am studying. I am doing well. I am studying the uh, interest-driven learning and uh, practice-linked identity uh, development of adolescents pursuing interests in digital media making, and that tracks very closely to uh, the work that I do uh, with Hive members. Um, so I did. Uh, uh, longitudinal case studies of um, adolescents and um, I found um, by um, following their pursuits of an interest that um, social support uh, had a lot to do with whether or not they were able to uh, succeed in their endeavors um, and uh, in addition to the types of support that could be found not only in, but very importantly in high programs, but not only in high programs, um, um, but also in schools and um, home. Uh, I found that uh, being able to signal successfully um, um, in terms of a young person signaling what they wanted, what they needed, and a provider being able to receive those signals and understand uh, how to respond um, as that being a very crucial part of the process as well. And, and um, mine focuses in, in, in really a kind of a parallel way to Dixie's, you know, um, looking at the organizational learning 
um, and the, the, the creation and production that happens amongst these organizations um, socially. And so really, at, you know, I kind of asked the question of really what is being part of a formal network do for organizations in terms of the ways that they explore new ideas, the ways that they collaborate, and the ways that they share. Um, and so a lot of that, uh, you know, really, it means I'm looking at three things. One is um, how organizations decide what problems to solve um, and what solutions are available. And so really, I've been finding there that, you know, being part of the network changes that. You know, you, there are new problems that you come across, not just by looking at your own context, but by paying attention to a lot of what other people are doing. Um, that uh, results in shifts in what you think is important to address and how you're going to address it as an organization. Uh, the second area is really in collaboration patterns. So looking both in depth as well as at a very high level at what kinds of problems do people solve what, through collaborations? Um, what kind of roles do, do organizations take on in consistent ways across organizations? And identified you know, you know, really big buckets of um, you know, sharing expertise, sharing networks and sharing material resources that were the big things happening in collaborations. And really, because it's an innovation-focused network, really expertise is the biggest thing that is shared and flows. And the last area that I've been looking at is really how, how um, uh, organizations are sharing broadly the results of their work. And, and, and this I've been looking a lot at um, how ideas from open source software coming through Mozilla uh, uh, change the way that happens. So ideas around working in the open, um, what does it mean to both uh, not just share the results at the end, but share uh, the possibility of people just openly participating in the creation of your new technology or program at the beginning in an ongoing way, and looking at what kinds of tensions come up, especially when we do that in the context of uh, working in youth development and working with non-dominant youth. So hopefully that is a little uh, thumbnail on, on it, on, on many Great. pages of writing. <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about evaluation needs of members of the Hive uh, NYC members. And um, I really want to encourage all of you to like take a stab at you know what's what's a need that you see and what are some that there you hear that you think are held in common, but also what are some differences across the organizations in terms of the needs of evaluation. Well, I mean, I can talk for. For, speak for us, um, very pragmatically, uh, it's what funders want to see. They want to understand how you're evaluating, how, how you're, you're showing impact in whatever it is that you, you plan to be doing uh, or are doing. Um, and, then, and then when you start thinking about that, um, and, and, and not to mention there's not always money to fund that development of evaluation. So, um, so you, you, you're you doing that and then you realize, of course, that you also need that to do what you're doing better. Um, so for us, it starts pragmatically and then and then became a necessity based on um, needing to, to, to do what we're doing better and to do with more people and, and that kind of thing. I think that's probably fairly common across uh, the network. Uh, do you, some of you, Brian, have common funders who have common requirements uh, in terms of evaluation? Um, I think both funders and contract, um, you know, uh, customers. You know, um, the yeah, I would assume that that there are common common funders. Um, I don't I don't know for a fact. Certainly, Hive Digital Media Learning Fund at, when it when it was the you know. Operational, um, you know, as a common funder. Nancy, can I ask you uh, what's your sense of the need of uh, this organization? But if you, and, and I'm not sure if you work with other organizations in the Hive to be aware of their particular needs. I just work with the Beam Center, um, but I think one of the of the also uh, of the needs that I see is that uh, when we apply for grants or when we are um, trying to express how our programs have an impact there is a there is a lot of uh, marketing sometimes in the in the media about how maybe computational thinking is uh, changing the world the, the lives of kids or how we need to code more or how we need to innovation 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 so i think um, there is sometimes this gap that we need to bridge when we are writing something so the stakeholders think that is worth what we are doing and also we understand that what we are doing has its limitations and that we are also start 
we are figuring out if our program is doing what we are wanting them to do at the same time that we are writing a grant. So there is always this kind of a dialectic process that we are, uh, we have a pilot of something, of course, once we are, are, are pitching for something bigger, but uh, how, how much we are going to scale it and how much it's going to actually uh, sound so attractive to the for the grant is always like a, something that it's, uh, it's hard to measure, it's hard to put in words, and it's hard to 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 be to be honest about how much things are happening, what is actually happening, and how that is still so important for a progressive change. It's not going to be a change that will change the the world of the of the life of these kids in three months or six months or the teachers either. But it's something that is progressive and it's still so valuable. And I think if that's that's some something that is hard hard to measure because there is no context to say like well, we're in this phase of this like three four five very important phases and we need first to get this one in order to achieve all the others. There's no framework still for those things. Um, tension between marketing and really convincing the funder that what you have as a program is worthwhile and actually gathering the evidence to show that um, and having the evidence to, to show when you go to the funder. Dixie and Rafi, what do you, from your perspective, what do you, what do you see as needs? Well, I just wanted to add to what Nancy was just saying because, um, you know, as I followed young people, I started with their experience at a high program, and, um, you know, you can definitely talk about some sort of changes that happen, you know, at the end, but you really don't see some of the really juicy outcomes until, you know, like six months, you know, a year later. So it, we really need to figure out a way to kind of talk about the longer time frames and what you know what we see at the end of a program could mean for a young person down the road like how to how to really assess that in a way that can help um, you know um, convey uh, some sort of evidence to funders or to one you know to to program organizers themselves um, that that can you know that can be effective for both um, you know situations and then also you know, we're finding that there's really different needs and, and um, sort of uh, um, um, evidence or, or, or sort of, uh, I guess, I'm, I'm, uh, in terms of like what young people say or what young people do, it's sort of different depending on um, uh, their prior experience coming into the program. So we've been doing an analysis and finding that it's really helpful to look at at least two general, you know, populations of youth. We're calling them uh, first timers and deep divers. And the first timers at the end of a program, you know, have a very different kind of way of talking about what they want to do next, as opposed to these deep divers. So that's just another, um, um, you know, thing to add to this mix as we as we talk about assessment. Yeah, and, and that like that issue you raised, Dixie, of. Um, some of the most juicy outcomes only happen way after and, and are, are less visible. It really points to um, <clears throat> the very uh, interesting um, position that I think a lot of organizations in the uh, informal sector um, are in when it comes to evaluation needs. So we're actually just with uh, our colleague um, Kevin Crowley from Pittsburgh uh, uh, recently, and he said something that was really striking t to me, which was that, you know, even though in the formal schooling system, um, we we talk so much about how it's like a really like um, you know intense context of accountability and testing and measurement, um, you know, in its own way, the informal sector is uh, has its own kind of like <laughs> brutal ruthlessness when it comes to issues of. Um, uh, of evaluation and outcomes, you know, it, it organizations uh, close because they, you know, if they are not able to tell an effective story, and, and an effective story might be based on evidence, or it might just be based on spin, you know, or just or or, or some you know a combination thereof. Uh, in, a, in a in a good case, you want uh, a really good storytelling is is important, um, but and, and often what funders expect from these organizations is. Uh, not necessarily um, reasonable. Often they want to hear that, uh, you know, say youth are choosing a new career or they're going to graduate from college or they're, um, you know, going to uh, have, you know, you know, uh, you know, radically new skills. And, 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 and I think like in, 
there's a certain way where you know the interventions that most of these programs uh, uh, are able to provide are very very powerful. But in another respect, like it's very very hard to have the resources to really track um, in, a, in, an, uh, in an ongoing way what where these kids go and what they do. You know, we have the you know uh, rare opportunity as a research lab to you know track kids over the course of six to eighteen months and even then we could only do it with a handful you know and that way we're able to do it in a very in-depth way and we're able to see really meaty outcomes but you know even for us as a dedicated research team doing that at scale is a really big challenge um, you know doing it for a much larger larger number of kids the other thing just to say in terms of the um, needs evaluation needs first is that many that there's just a real kind of like bouquet of youth development and digital literacy and social justice outcomes. So across the network, you can probably find like maybe two dozen different big areas, whether it's social emotional learning or digital literacy or, you know, computational thinking or, you know, youth leadership and activism. So there's common outcomes that people are going for, but there's also divergent based on organization. And the other is in terms of population needs. Uh, so some organizations uh, really focus much more on uh, young people or focus on specific sets of young people like you know girls in STEM or focusing on 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 black girls coding or etc and then others might focus on on teachers um, or uh, doing professional development for other informal learning organizations so the evalu evaluation needs to uh, vary quite a bit based on the kinds of um, change and the population of change uh, that a given organization is looking to work with Great. Great. So, so I want to turn, turn us to, to hearing a little bit more about the outcomes charrette that you all facilitated in New York with Hive NYC members. And uh, uh, you might say what a charrette is and, and how it was structured. And uh, tell us a little bit about that and how, um, you know, what the hope is for the measures that came out of that. Dixie, do you want to start off on this one? Uh, sure. So, uh, yeah, that, that was a really nice uh, collaboration <laughs> that we engaged in with the CLRN team. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we stepped in as, um, um, you know, Bill et al. were, you know, uh, grappling with the, these uh, survey items and wanting to get more input from um, uh, practitioners, you know, people on the ground interacting with youth around um, certain indicators um, uh, related to uh, connected learning outcomes. And uh, it, um, you know, because we have such a nice, robust way of uh, engaging with uh, members of the Hive, um, Rafi and I um, thought it would be wonderful to bring this general issue around helping um, you know, researchers develop better survey items, items that would serve uh, program facilitators and organizers better, um, uh, you know, to, to these meetings. So, um, so we, we started off, oh, so, the, and basically a charrette is really um, an activity around designing. Um, it, some people call it design sprints, and there's a lot of stuff on, online around how to do that well. Um, it involves, you know, um, defining a problem space and then having uh, discussions, further discussions around, uh, you know, in order to make sure folks, you know, we can then take the general problem space and then have everyone in the room really understand it and, and, and define it for ourselves and then, you know, go into um, um, designs of interventions with folks presenting their interventions and getting feedback and um, it can also involve a lot of brainstorming ideas, mm -hmm. putting stuff on, on on the board uh, using sticky notes and, and grouping and whatnot. Um, so uh, in terms of this meeting, it was interesting because it was less about designing interventions. It was around designing I um, items. So, uh, But the general uh, um, uh, method was, was sort of similar. Um, so uh, we started off with a presentation um, to define sort of the, the issues uh, around um, uh, what we want to accomplish in terms of creating, you know, ultimately creating uh, a new survey that related to connected learning outcomes, um, what the uh, general sort of 
what the researchers have accomplished thus far and sort of what sort of issues they were running into. Um, and then uh, we went into an exercise where we had folks, um, um, people in the audience, uh, take uh, some youth personas that um, folks at CLRN and um, stuff that was coming out of our work um, uh, had produced. And then we um, basically had folks come up with some indicators for the four basic uh, outcomes around, uh, I think, Bill, you talked about earlier, the, you know, um, civic engagement, you know, what would a young person say to indicate that they were um, feeling more civically engaged or not feeling more civically engaged, you know, whether they're having fun or whether they weren't, things like that. Um, uh, Rafi, would you like to <laughs> add anything that I've forgotten? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that covers a lot of it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, one thing that's important to note is that you guys, uh, you know, uh, Bill, your team was doing um, charrettes, you know, both here in New York with educators, but also in, in Colorado with young people. So it wasn't just educators' voices um, coming into uh, uh, impact what the survey design would be, but also young people's voices. And, and really, I mean, I think the, the larger piece here um, was that you guys, you know, from, my, you know, from what I understand, it was, you know, this was coming from the CLRN, um, you know, uh, Connected Learning Measurement Tool team. But you, it sounded like you, you guys came to us with, with a problem, which is that certain things uh, when you were working on the survey um, weren't popping. They weren't quite capturing what you were hearing in the qualitative side and, and, and that it wasn't capturing what you knew were, were good outcomes. And so, you know, and I think it's, it's really radical from a certain perspective to think that in one sense it's really obvious, but in another sense the way things are usually done is that people with PhDs in psychometrics, you know, sit in a room and review all the literature and kind of like talk on end and, and debate about construct validity um, and, uh, you know, then come up with something that eventually maybe some people use. You know, the contrast here to that was just that, you know, go to the people who are interacting with young people all the time. Go to the young people themselves. Talk to them about what are, what are things that they would uh, hear young people say that would let them know that things are going well or aren't going well. And I think this is really important for, you know, folks that are doing whether it's designing evaluation for your own programs or serving it as an evaluator for other programs, is that like, you know, measurement, you know, I'm, I'm by, by no means a measurement design specialist at all, but this was really insightful for me that like ways of going about collaborative design that I was already familiar with actually can be applied to measurement too, that you can go and bring your team together, bring a te your team of educators and some kids together, and you know, if you've got something you're trying to create, you know, some measure around, and tailor around, you know, talk to people. I mean, that's fundamentally what it's about, uh, is hear what they have to say. So I thought that, that was really revealing for me uh, as, as somebody who's been doing this work for a while. So. That's great. Thank you. And I will add for people who are watching that you can find a, a report on this activity on the Hive Research Labs website. And I think uh, we've linked to it actually for this week's uh, webinar session and also on the DML research tools website uh, that's on uh, DML hub uh, we have the items that we generated there so those are free for other people to use if you're intrigued by what you've heard here I want to turn to Brian now and, and Nancy too and Brian tell us a little bit about the work uh, you mentioned earlier you work with teachers tell us about the work of the Beam Center in professional development and connected teaching Okay, uh, so we find that we are working in um, a, 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 a rapidly merging area where for the formal and the informal uh, are, are coming together. Um, and and no, no more so than uh, much of the work that we do in collaboration with uh, public schools in New York City. Um, one aspect of that collaboration uh, is the professional development that Nancy leads uh, that we call Connected Teaching. And um, um, it, it, you know, it, it is, it, it's us bringing to the, 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 to the teachers um, some of the what might be considered informal techniques of uh, making projects 
uh, that can, that can both enhance their practice, evolve their practice, and um, make accessible to their students uh, aspects of the knowledge that they are working with them on uh, that um, would otherwise be less accessible. So um, we've and we were we were funded through the Hive Digital Media Learning Fund uh, for to work with 24 teachers. Um, that work is ongoing. Um, we're at a stage now where some of the schools that we worked with uh, initially are, are coming back and sending more teachers. Um, so we have a lot of um, evaluation challenges. I mean, it, to some degree, we're working in an area that where the evaluation is a little bit should be easier. Um, but but our our challenges relate to how the teachers. Um, own practice and approach is being changed. Uh, and I think Nancy can uh, you know, speak to that more. Exactly. Yeah, so, so we designed this professional development basically uh, with a constructivism uh, approach. So we, the first two days of the professional development, so by the way, this is the third iteration of the professional development. We have started with a smaller group. Then we interview all the teachers. We were seeing how much they were actually implementing what they were learning in the professional development in the classroom. And we have changed it twice after, after that first uh, pilot. Um, so what we discovered is that if we just give teachers uh, the use of technology, even if they do projects in the professional development, they will sometimes do not implement any of those uh, technologies and uh, methodologies inside the classroom. So what we decided to do is from day zero they need to come with a project that they want to do in their class and then we're going to help to facilitate that pro further prototyping and then we are going to go in the classroom with them to help them do the workflow of the projects. So for the first day teachers just learn about technology, we did a little bit of the mindstorm from Papert, so we do a little of pedagogy, we did a little about the technology and then they start uh, using understanding by design to plan a little bit what they're going to do in their classroom. So that's for the first two days. For the next two days, they already have an idea of what they want to do. They start building a prototype of their project that the, that the students build, will build with them. And we pair them with a, uh, we call them a domain specialist that is someone that is very uh, knowledgeable in that particular area. It can be either uh, someone from the from the NYU ITP that knows a lot about electronics or someone that is more like a are artists or depend on what the teacher is going to do and they build a working prototype of what they're going to implement in the class. And then uh, they start implementing the activity and then for three days our domain specialist will go with them into the classroom and help them implement the thing. Because I mean our second iteration we found that other problem for like this kind of project based learning is not just the, that they sometimes do not know the materials or they are afraid of the use of technology but they also don't understand how to uh, manage the classroom or have like the workflow of the project implementing inside the classroom so we were also like trying to help with that with that part and so we have done already uh, some qualitative uh, well we, we interview all the teachers after they finish their their four first classes their four first like a visit to the beam center and some of them they started already the implementation on some of them they haven't started implementation yet so there are many the many, many things that I think that are very crucial for us to understand. Uh, so I have noticed that in some cases, uh, they, are, they, they claim that their identity changed a little bit. So they say something like, uh, oh, I didn't thought that uh, I, could be a, I, could do, I could be a project-based learning teacher, or I, don't, I didn't know about, uh, I could use technology in the classroom. I didn't know about cross, we, we focus a lot on like a cross, cross uh, disciplinary projects with something that we promote a lot. So they were also saying like, oh, I didn't know that I can actually use uh, cross-disciplinary curriculum to teach what I have to teach. Um, oh, others, um, what did I say? Um, no? Oh, nothing, I was, my sound just went a little bit uh, oh. dead, so I, some of that, but I'm glad uh, everybody else was able to hear. Um, say a little bit about, so you mentioned identity change. What are some of the things that the you think the teachers want to get out of it that you want to measure whether they're getting out of it? Um, you know, what will they? What do you? What do they hope that they'll learn from this? You think? So, 
At the beginning, I was very interested in how they will use, they will um, include technology into the classroom, specifically uh, uh, digital fabrication. So some of the schools already have uh, 3D printers, or some of them have um, a laser cutter, or they were trying to get more robotics, so microcontrollers. And I was like thinking, like, well, maybe I can help them to actually use those things. That was the first iteration. Then I started thinking that. Uh, that was cool, but I don't think teachers and students were getting anything out of the technology, just using technology for the sake of using technology. So it was more about how, more, I, I switched a little bit more into project-based learning and thinking about, okay, it doesn't have to be actually uh, high-tech unless there is a justification for that, but maybe it's just giving more autonomy to the, to the students and like shifting to more active learning and see if uh, teachers will, the project will be like an excuse for them to start shifting to this direction. And that is one of the things that I think is I'm more interested right now to see how much they are giving more autonomy to, to, for learning to their students. Uh, so we are focusing more the project that they are doing, like with those kinds of uh, um, of things in mind, not just with the use of technology. But I think the use of technology becomes like a Trojan horse for this kind of motivation for teachers and for students at the same time. So I'm also very interested in how teachers are using it because now we start following the teachers that are implementing these things. And I kind of discovered three stages. So one of them, they use it just as a, something on top of what they're doing in the, in the classroom. It's more like an excuse to engage kids a little bit more. So they're just using it as an activity that, uh, but something that the kids already saw, they already learned, or they already cover in the curriculum, and then they do like a craft activity that is accompanied with that. Some others are using the technology and the project-based learning more for like a, creating a supportive material, something that the teachers can use to later show and then can help uh, kids to understand something, but the kids that are not building uh, something from scratch or they're not exploring any concepts to that. And then other teachers are doing more combination of like uh, using this project base for actually teaching something. And that would be like more towards what I want to, 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 to go. But I also see some value in all the, these other two stages, and I would like to see how they interact, what is the combination, how they, how they uh, have a correlation or not with the identity of the teacher that, of course, I still don't uh, classify very well. Uh, many questions. And sounds like you're using uh, interviews to get at some of this. Do you have other methodologies that you're using, Nancy, to draw so, to uh, these inferences? Yeah, so... Uh, so I I, did, I was I studied with uh, Paolo Blixen from Stanford and he has this index that is called the Exploratory Exploration and Fabrication Technology Index. So I'm very interested in like uh, seeing how that uh, what what is it? so this index is measuring performance and confidence in technology. So I'm interested in seeing how these two things are changing in teachers and I'm also very interested in uh, seeing how their concept of intelligence more in the current work. Uh, kind of uh, idea is changing, is that shifting from a more like crystallized to like a more malleable or type of intelligence. Uh, but I'm very interested if you have any other uh, ideas of uh, what can we be measuring there. That's great. That's a good challenge uh, out to the group. Rafi, uh, you have a quick question? Yeah, it's a question and may maybe an answer too. I was going to ask you, you know, one of the things that's really awesome about your guys' project is that you're really looking to create agency on the part of the teachers to create, you know, to, yes, integrate technology and, and new ways of pedagogy, but to do that on their own terms, to um, uh, create a, a new project-based learning, or it's not like you're giving them, like, here is the, here is the, here's the project-based learning uh, curriculum that already exists, and we're going to train you to adapt it. You're asking them to be creators, right? And so that, to me, first of all, it's a great way of doing professional development. Um, because it's asking people to be designers, which is always, I think, to me, fundamentally the way we want to do pedagogy for young people as well as for uh, adults. Um, and so I'm curious if you ever look at the at the things they create themselves, the the, the lesson plans, as um, as an indicator for what their understanding is, uh, where their level of kind of creativity is, where their level of technological fluency is. Is that are those artifacts themselves? And I'm not sure what to what degree they are. Uh, observable artifact or accessible artifacts, but do you guys look to those, and or could you look to them? So we are collecting all their um, their lesson plans. We ask them to be writing them from day one. So we have a folder for each of them, and we have them. I haven't taken a look 
to be honest to any of that, but that's a great <laughs> idea. And we do document their process. So we have like pictures from the first day of their artifacts and of their last artifact that they made. And right. we have some pictures of the of their implementations so of the Cures artifacts as well. Uh, so but that, that 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 would be a great a great idea to start looking at uh, maybe to give them more freedom of how they are making their lesson plan and then just see what exactly what are they writing. That would be very interesting. Yeah. yeah, generally artifacts of practice are really great kinds of tools to use in an evaluation because they're not obtrusive and you can collect them fairly easily. And the trick there is to analyze them systematically to look at change over time. To what extent do, uh, does the integration happen more? Do, is there more of a student project and product that um, students have a, a lot of autonomy you're talking about? Um, so those can be really great tools. Um, Brian, what of the evaluation has been useful to you as sort of a, a program leader in this? Like, what, what, what do you find, and what would, what would you find more useful if uh, you could get some help from our audience about? Well, um, I, you know, I think aside from proving efficacy of our for for of our programs, I would say that, you know, our number one concern is that is whether or not we are helping the school move the needle um, and um, whether or not uh, we're enabling the, the school leader or, or the collective teachers to um, implement in their school something they think is valuable. Um, that, it, you know, it isn't always easy other than um, other than you know tracking students' grades and attendance, which is also not an easy thing to set up um, with the school. Um, it, it would be great if we could um, figure out some way for the for the, the school leader and, and the rest of the teachers to give us feedback in a way that that really connects to what they're able to get done with the students. Um, you know, anecdotally. We love um, we love hearing that um, from a teacher. Oh well, we were doing this soldering project, and I was able to have uh, one of the students who works with you outside of school run a group because I didn't have to do it. Like that that that's about as as good uh, feedback as we can get about how our, our how our programs are working. But but there should be more and and a more um, a formulaic way of, of assessing, finding that feedback. And, and Being able to get that. Yeah. So we're at a time where it would be great if you could um, sharply pose a challenge for our class. And uh, this is a challenge that I invite people to um, contribute to online in the online discussion. Uh, and my students and the class here at CU will be certainly contributing to that. So tell us a little bit about an evaluation challenge that we might help you about, help you with. Um. Nancy is looking at her piece of paper, and she is going to issue that challenge shortly. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so, um, so. Hello? Sorry, again. Yes. Okay. Sorry, you can hear me right. Yes? Okay. So one of the of the of the things that we are doing is that we are showing some of the projects from previous teachers that have doing this and then it start just uh, think, like talking about those projects and see what do they think about it, if they think about so so so, so for them to reflect more about what it means for them to to do what they are doing and for them to get some measurements from themselves if they are in the right or if they're doing what they are expecting to be doing, if they're achieving the goal that they want to, to, to achieve. So it's more like a reflective thing. It's a more like a, something that I want to integrate into the PD as an ongoing practice. And I was wondering if you, if you have any idea of how, uh, how to guide that, how to give it like some follow-up at the same time 
So after they finish doing it, they will be able to keep tracking their <coughs> their own practice in a, in this reflective framework way for for projects and um, and. If you have any idea also how to make it the less intrusive, because some teachers don't feel uh, very comfortable when they are being discussed, their project has been discussed uh, publicly in the in the group or things like that. That's um, great. So supporting reflections and how to make those reflections less intrusive, and and also I, I hear you know safe uh, safe for teachers to be able to express what it is they're learning and maybe even questions that they have. Uh, that sounds great. Um, so I want to uh, invite everyone this week to respond to this challenge uh, posed by our panelists today. And that discussion will be happening in the forum for the course. <coughs> the URL for that is forum.dmlhub.net. And you can continue this conversation from today using the Twitter hashtag CLEVAL. Um, and, uh, as much as possible. I'd like you to try to think about something that will make your contributions helpful to the panelists. So when you go to the post, see if there's something that you can add on to or build on to an answer that's already there, rather than just starting a new topic. And that way we can also get a conversation going online. And so I want to you please uh, join me in thanking uh, Brian and Nancy and Dixie and Rafi for joining us today. It's been a great conversation. appreciate you all uh, being here. And I will just say that our next webinar is scheduled for Monday, March 7th at 10 a.m. Pacific. And then members of the Composing Our World team, a project that's collaboratively designing a project-based curriculum in ninth grade literacy that's funded through the George Lucas Educational Research Foundation will be joining me. And our focus will be on developing and using evidence of implementation and evaluation. So please join me next time. And thank you for joining us in the session today. Thanks, Paul.